I'm Bob Greenspan, and as chair of the Board of Trustees of the Nantucket Athenaeum, I want to uh, welcome you all to the very first of the 2013 Geschke uh, Lecture Series. Uh, the first uh, boring bit of housekeeping is to please uh, uh, turn off all those favorite electronic devices. Um, for 178 years, the Athenaeum has been bringing educational and cultural programs to our community. Um, that's a very long time. And although we are a public library, two-thirds of our annual operating uh, revenues, well over a million dollars, uh, must be uh, raised each year from private sources. Uh, each and every year we have that uh, continuing responsibility. Thus, programs such as the one you will hear tonight are made uh, possible only through the generous support of our donors. Uh, the Geschke Lecture Series is made possible by grants from the Geschke Foundation, thank you Nan and Chuck again, as always, and the National Endowments for the Humanities and um, through uh, generous individual gifts. And we thank each and every one of you for your support. Uh, tonight, I'm uh, delighted to report that we're in for a real treat. David Owen has spent a semester pretending to be a high school student, has toured Liverpool with 66 American Beatles fanatics, has played golf with the father of the guitarist of The Doors, <laughs> has played golf with the King of Morocco, and even Donald Trump. David also, one of my personal favorites, has set the record for using the largest number of swear words in a single paragraph in The New Yorker. <laughs> and speaking of The New Yorker, David has been a staff writer at that wonderful magazine for over 20 years. He is also a contributing editor uh, to Golf Digest and has written many books, including um, quite a few on a, a, a favorite subject of his, which is the environment. Uh, David's current assignment for The New Yorker, le least, least you think he writes only about golf and funny things, is a, a, about uh, breeding giant pandas in captivity. We may hear some more about that tonight. Uh, David grew up in Kansas City, like his colleague at The New Yorker and speaker at the Athenaeum, Calvin Trillin. Um, he was uh, an editor of the uh, Lampoon in his undergraduate days at Harvard. Uh, his wife, Ann Hodgman, uh, who was also uh, uh, an editor of Lampoon and is here with him, uh, is, is a writer as well, as are their two children. So David and his family, uh, you might think of as the perfect Athenaeum uh, family for us. Now, I say perfect, but I really mean almost perfect. The only blemish in, in the sparkling uh, resume is that uh, before today, uh, David had never been to Nantucket. And to make matters worse, uh, rumor has it that David and his family have been known to go to that enemy island across the way. Um, now, maybe the um, uh, inter-island rivalry between uh, uh, us and that other island is overblown, but I'm not entirely sure if that's true. I don't know if you saw the Boston Globe article a couple of years ago about Nantucket versus Martha's Vineyard. It was one of my favorites, and I, I offer you two quotes. First from a Martha's Vineyard teenager about Nantucket, and she says, we don't like Nantucket at all, pause, like not one bit. And then the Nantucket teenager, when asked to comment about Martha's Vineyard, says, Martha's Vineyard is just revolting. And then he's trying to find the biggest insult he can come up with. He says, it's just like the Jersey Shore. <laughs> now, I think we're a forgiving group here in Nantucket, so we'd like to welcome uh, David Owen and, uh, uh, and his first uh, visit to the real island. The island where actually the beaches are all public and not private. David? Thank you. I did grow up in Kansas City, and on the other side of the state was St. Louis, uh, our enemy city. And when the St. Louis Arch was built, St. Louis began billing itself as the gateway to the Midwest which uh, we thought was presumptuous. 
And because uh, we had always thought of Kansas City as the gateway to the West, and uh, had thought of St. Louis, you know, if anything, as the gateway to Kansas City. <laughs> um, Bob is right. This is my first visit to Nantucket, and I've been going to Martha's Vineyard for almost 40 years, and my wife for more than 50. And uh, we did uh, always think of Nantucket as our enemy island, and, but. Uh, we got here today around noon, and uh, so far it's not as bad as I had been led to believe. <laughs> I've wanted to be a, a writer pretty much all my life, and uh, have been one since uh, just before we graduated from college. And as a result, I've had some pretty interesting experiences. A couple of years ago for The New Yorker, I went to South America to Colombia, to Bogota. And on my first day in the city, uh, two women in an old Toyota drove me uh, to the outskirts of town to an industrial park. And there in a building that from the outside looked like a warehouse, the man I'd come to interview, whose name was Miguel Caballero, uh, shot me in the stomach with a 38 caliber revolver from about four inches away. And, uh, I felt a little thump and then nothing. But fortunately, uh, the reason I'd come to interview him is that his business was manufacturing bulletproof clothing for uh, mostly for Latin American dictators and uh, Hollywood stars. And I was wearing one of his garments, a black suede jacket with, with bulletproof panels in it. So I have at home, I have the, my bullet and my cartridge, that, my souvenirs from, uh, from my visit to Bogota. The, <laughs> when I was a little worried about traveling to Colombia, but I uh, talked to a, a golf buddy of mine, wh whom Bob has also met, who is a lawyer who does most of his business in South America. And I asked him if it was okay to, to travel to Colombia despite the, war the dire warnings on the State Department website. And he said, yes, it was fine. I could go anywhere, not to worry about it, uh, but not to go to Mexico. But he, I, um, when I got back, I interviewed some, uh, by telephone, some engineers at DuPont, which is the company that makes uh, Kevlar, the best known bulletproof material. And we were having a, t a conference call on the telephone, and about 15 or 20 minutes into the call, uh, I, said, I said, so, am I the only person on this call who's actually been shot in one of these things? And there was a, just a, there was a, a silence on the other end of the line. And it turns out that American manufacturers of bulletproof clothing don't test their uh, products on human beings, not even on reporters. And uh, the, one of the engineers said that, in fact, DuPont doesn't even refer to Kevlar as bulletproof. They call it bullet resistant. <laughs> so I was glad that I had not talked to them before I went to South America because I enjoyed being shot, and I wouldn't have wanted them to talk me out of it. Uh, my wife, Ann Hodgman, as Bob said, is also a writer. We met in college uh, on our hands and knees, scraping our own vomit and the vomit of, of several other people off the floor of the basement of the Harvard Lampoon. And we were married uh, not long afterward. We've been married for 35 years this summer. For the first seven years of our married life together, we lived in a utopian environmentalist community in New York State. Uh, we lived in a very small space, only about 750 square feet. We didn't have a car. We didn't have a washer and dryer. Uh, when we had to travel long distances, we, we either walked or we took public transportation. Uh, we didn't own any very large appliances. Our electric bill worked out to about a dollar a day. Uh, that utopian community was Manhattan. It was New York City. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, about 10 years ago, I wrote a, uh, an article for The New Yorker in which I made the case that the greenest place in the United States was Manhattan. Uh, and it, the, uh, the numbers are, are pretty interesting. New York City residents have, are the smallest per capita energy users in the United States. Uh, they live in the smallest spaces. They produce the least amount of solid waste. Uh, they own fewer appliances. And, and most important of all, they have the lowest rate of car ownership of any place in the United States. 
the 77% of Manhattan households don't own even one car. Uh, by contrast, 16% uh, of households in South Dakota own five or more cars. <laughs> so it's a big difference. And it's a bigger difference uh, than it even seems because globally, automobiles are the, the, the vector of, of environmental damage because they make possible all these other things. Um, well, I wrote about that uh, about um, 10 years ago, and then I wrote about it again in, in two books uh, on, on, that sort of grew out of that initial article in The New Yorker. And uh, one thing that I've learned from that experience, if you are a connoisseur of big carbon footprints, uh, sometimes you should check out the uh, publicity tour itineraries of people who write books about the environment. That nobody, I don't think, probably has a bigger carbon footprint than Bill McKibben if you look at his speaking schedule uh, going all over the place. So nobody has to follow my example. Just uh, do what I say in the books. My first job after college was as a fact checker in, at New York Magazine. There was a columnist there named Sidney Zion, and we all uh, used to fight with each other to check his columns because they didn't have any facts in them, and it was the easiest assignment that you could have. <laughs> and a few months into my job, I fact-checked my own salary and realized that I wasn't making enough even to cover the rent in our apartment. So even though I had nothing to replace it with, I, I quit. Uh, I didn't do anything for a little while, and then I had the idea that I would go back to high school. I would pretend to be a high school student and write a book about it, and, and that's what I did. Uh, Ann and I had been married for not very long, and I disguised myself as a, as a teenager. My uh, literary agent posed as my mother in the days before Photoshop. I was able to make, uh, with great difficulty, uh, much more difficulty than you would have today, uh, to make false uh, documents for myself. And nowadays, you'd be arrested immediately as a sexual predator or something, but I spent four months uh, going to a large public high school and then, and then wrote about that experience. Uh, I took Anne to a, a, a dance as my date. This is probably the low point of the experience. Uh, for her, walking into the high school gymnasium without adequate preparation by me, it was like having a terrible LSD flashback. All the worst moments of her own adolescence came rushing back to her. I tried to put my arm around her and elbowed her in the head, and, and we, we left not long after that and had po possibly the longest uh, two-hour train ride back to New York City that anybody has ever, uh, has ever taken. Uh, when that book came out, the one of the first things that happened was that the, the movie rights to the book uh, were optioned uh, by Barry Manilow. <laughs> it, the movie and song rights to the book. Manilow was going to make a movie based on my experience, and apparently it was going to be a musical, and he was going to play me, and there were going to be songs, too. <laughs> and I th maybe that I think on my gravestone, uh, the inscription will be that it was almost a a movie or a song by Barry Manilow. Uh, but I think now probably I'm just as glad that that did not happen and the reason it didn't is that a, a, a similar a movie on a similar topic, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, uh, was underway and came out at the same time. It, made a much, it was a much better movie than my book would have made, uh, especially with Barry Manilow playing me. <laughs> uh, for 30 years, Ann and I have lived very happily outside of New York. Uh, in the, the opposite of New York, in a small town in northwestern Connecticut that some of you know. Uh, we live in an 18th century house that's insulated mainly with uh, mouse nests and old dust. So the, we uh, could just about put our furnace in the yard for all it does, uh, all the good it does inside the house. The heat just goes straight up through it. Uh, and yet we bought it uh, very impetuously. We decided that with our baby daughter that New York was too small for us, and our apartment was too small for us. And I went by myself uh, with a realtor, and the first house she showed me, I said, I think it's too small. Uh, she took me to another house, and I went out in the yard after I'd walked through it, and I counted the rooms on my fingers, and I said, I think this is big enough, I'll take it. 
and uh, her jaw dropped. And she said, don't, don't you think your wife should see it? And I said, well, she'll love it. And, uh, uh, but it turned out she didn't. Uh, when we went back, <laughs> when we back, went back, she didn't like it. And it was, we actually had a hard time finding it. And not only finding it, I had a hard time finding the town because I wasn't quite sure exactly where it was. But we then walked through it in pouring rain and then had a conference, the two of us, afterward that night and discussed it and decided that even though we didn't like the house very much, that buying it would be less trouble than uh, going to all the, the, the nuisance of spending a whole nother day finding a house to buy and move into and that it would be less inconvenient to ourselves to just go ahead and suck it up and buy it than to uh, and spend the rest of our lives in a place we didn't like. <laughs> but everything worked out great, surprisingly. The uh, one-year-old daughter of the lawyer who handled our real estate transaction turned out to be the best friend of our daughter, and we became their best friends, and then we met all their friends. and, and uh, I think our experience with that purchase can be distilled to a single universal law, which is that if, if you have no idea what you're doing, uh, more information won't help you, and you're, you're more likely to make a good decision by accident than you are on purpose. And so uh, you should probably just go ahead and, and roll the dice. Uh, at any rate, it, it worked for us. We were still pretty young when we bought the house, and it was beginning to feel gloomy about being a grown-up. Uh, there are many reasons to, there are many things about adulthood not to like, and I was discovering more and more of them, uh, and, and just and feeling a little bit wistful about how, how much fun it had been to be younger than we were, and I think now as I think back, I think maybe some part of when I decided that the, the way that I should make a living was by pretending to be a high school student, that maybe that was involved in that. But shortly after we bought our house, I made an important discovery, which is that being a grown-up can be even better than being a kid uh, because you have more money and a car. And when I was a kid, my friends and I used to, we'd steal construction supplies from houses that were being built in our neighborhood and we would build tree houses and things like that and it was great. But I realized that now that I, I had a whole house that I could play with and what's more I could buy uh, not only fresh plywood, I didn't have to take it from construction sites and I could also use saws, power saws that my, my parents never would have let me handle uh, when I was a kid. And there were still nevertheless obstacles to overcome and one of them I, disco I discovered a feeling that many men in the room may be familiar with which is a, a sort of a paralyzing fear of hardware stores and lumber yards you it's difficult to go into a place and ask for something and potentially re reveal your total ignorance of uh, of what you're asking for hardware is especially intimidating and the the night before I had to buy two by fours for the first time for a construction project that I was working on I woke up in the middle of the night in sort of a sweat, uh, worried about how I was going to pull this off. And in the morning, when I went to the lumber yard, I walked around in the hardware part for a long time, just you know, looking at the various glues and uh, getting my courage up. And finally, uh, I went out to the lumber yard and I, and I told the guy that I needed six uh, eight foot two by fours. And he said, Doug Fur, KD. And I had, I had, I was, it was as though he had punched me in the face. Uh, it was not, uh, you wouldn't think a malicious question and yet it was, it, I had no idea what to respond. I later learned that it, the guy didn't know any more than I did really and, and I later had the confidence to go buy two by fours but at the time I was reminded of the first time that I bought condoms and I, uh, I, it took me even longer to get my courage up before I went in and, and went in and I asked the pharmacist uh, for seven, which was a number that I had, after almost endless uh, thinking, had decided was the sort of quantity that a seasoned purchaser <laughs> might ask for. It was like the underwear that have the day of the week, the seven pairs of underwear with the day of the week on them. And he said, well, they come, they come either three to, a, three to a box or a dozen. 
And I said, I said, well, in that case, I'll take nine, <laughs> which would cover my seven. And he said, well, in that case, you might as well buy a dozen because it costs the same. And so, well, and then I bought them, and it took, it took a, a couple of hours before my heartbeat returned to normal. <laughs> but that was pretty much what the experience of going into a hardware store is like. Uh, fairly quickly, though, I got pretty good at working on our house, and to the point where we would be getting ready to have uh, me members of our families coming over for Thanksgiving, and I would suddenly decide that the time had come to take up the dining room floor or to rip down a wall in the living room. And uh, we, our children grew up thinking that bare, unfinished sheetrock was a decorative wall treatment and to, that it was perfectly normal to have a toilet in our backyard, which we had for a while because we didn't know where else to put it. Uh, but eventually, we got the house more or less put together uh, and just in the nick of time because uh, one day, uh, a very good friend of Anne's and mine, who was the wife, in fact, of the, the lawyer who had handled our real estate transaction when we bought the house. She invited me out to play golf with her, and, and I'd never played before, but I went. And something, we played just nine holes, and I was terrible, but something clicked. And those of you who are golfers understand uh, something, something, it's a drug. And on some people are highly susceptible to the addiction. There's something about it. It, 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 even if you're a terrible player, every once in a while you hit a good shot and you are rewarded at whatever the rate our brain responds to, not too much, not too little, uh, and I got hooked. I had also just finished writing a book about our house and I needed another project and I realized that if I wrote about golf, there were a lot of things that I would be able to do. Uh, the my brother is a very good golfer, he's seven years younger, and he, he, he grew up playing golf, but there are things that I've been able to do as a, as a golf writer that I can't tell him about because he would be too upset if he knew all the things that I get to do it, 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 as, as a golfer. The first thing I did was to go to golf school at uh, Sea Island, at what was then the Golf Digest School, and I wrote about it for Esquire magazine. And the thing, and I, the thing that I said in Esquire was that the night before I left, I was, I was as excited as if I were 15 years old and on my way to screwing school. And <laughs> when, when I was there in my class, we, we spent all day hitting, hitting golf balls, hundreds and hundreds of golf balls, and we went out and played. And when I got back, I had improved. I, had the skills that enabled me to improve. And I was then able to go to, I went to Scotland, and I got this succession of wonderful assignments. Golf Digest sent me off to play the 10 best courses in the country. Every uh, two years, they put out a list of the top 100 courses in the country, and they wanted me to play the top 10 because they didn't know what those were going to be. I'd better play the top 20 uh, to make sure I got them all in. And I would come back to my little club at home and come uh, bounding up the steps of the clubhouse with another fresh pile of, of scorecards and all my friends would just turn their backs and walk away. Uh, but there are many great things about golf for those, those, those of you who, don't, who, who, who do play or those of you who don't. One is that I think it's, it really is playing and most grown-ups don't play uh, enough in the kid sense. Uh, I discovered that when I was working on our house, that pretending to be a carpenter was a, was a form of playing, playing the way kids do, where you sort of forget everything else and you just and kind of get lost in your activity. Uh, golf was like that for me, uh, just the ability to, despite all appearances, to believe that you're doing something important and to have every other thought banished from your mind. And, and, uh, and that was, that's what it has, has been for me. I've also gotten to do a lot of fun things. Uh, when I turned 50, Golf Digest treated me to a, a full midlife makeover. I got to go have my swing redone and I got new golf clubs. Uh, a few years ago, Golf Digest sent me to play the, the all 14 courses where the British Open has been played, to play them all in one two-week trip. So in two weeks, I played courses in England and Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, and then came home. I, in the late 90s, I got to write a book about the Masters that was invited by Augusta National. And, and I got, for about two and a half years, I would go down a week at a time 
And when I was hired by uh, the man who was the chairman at the time, a man named Jackson Stevens, who was a, 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 owned a huge, Stevens Inc., a huge uh, investment bank in, in, in Arkansas. And he wanted to look me over before he hired me to do this. And we discussed terms. And, and then I said, I said, Mr. Stevens, I said, the real reason uh, I'm interested in doing this is that I'd like to play the golf course. And he said, well, you, can, you can play the golf course. And I said, I'd really like to play it a lot. And uh, so he said that I could play it a lot. In fact, I could play it whenever I wanted to. And, and I did. For two and a half years, I played it whenever I wanted to. And when that project finally ended, uh, I, uh, I had tears in my eyes as I was uh, flying away from Augusta for the last time. Despite all those uh, experiences, my favorite place to play is my little golf course at home, which is just nine holes. It's a, the golf club was founded in 1889. The course was built in 1903. And I play with a group of regular guys who Bob has played with them. Uh, on the solstice uh, two years ago, we played 100 holes. On, we, we played from can to can't, from when you can see until you can't. We got up at we teed off at 5 o'clock in the morning and played till 8.30 at night, all walking, and three of us finished 101 holes. We play every Sunday. We make teams by drawing numbered poker chips from a hat. We take turns making lunch. We don't have a, 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 kit, uh, we don't have a restaurant at our club, so every week someone else, usually the big money winner the week before, brings uh, hamburger patties and hot dogs, and we, we grill them in the parking lot uh, behind the clubhouse. We have a number of rules that are not widely used outside of our golf club. We, we, if we have a tie, if our matches end in a tie, we play them off, and we always play them off on the practice green. And just uh, two weeks ago, we had a, a playoff where the, uh, the format was it, you had to hit a, a pitch shot from the carpet, the indoor-outdoor carpet in the bag room where the golf clubs are kept across the first tee, over the first tee fence, and on, over a tree, and then onto the practice green uh, closest to the pin. And we had uh, eight competitors who did that. We had to keep people off the first tee while they did it. We've had uh, playoffs that were shots were hit out of the back of uh, Nick Rimbaki's pickup truck, which he backed up to the fence by the practice green. It has a plastic liner in it, and you can put a tremendous amount of spin on a, on a lob wedge if you hit it properly out of the, the, uh, the, the, the bed of a pickup truck. One member of our group uh, is an architect, and he designed the, redesigned our, the men's locker room. And one of the, the features he, 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 he gave us was he placed the urinal, a window directly over it, so that the, anybody who was using the, the locker room could still talk to the people who are grilling the hamburgers right outside the window. <laughs> and somebody at some point realized that if you stuck your head out the window, you could just see the practice screen uh, down to the left. And so one of the playoffs uh, we had was, was a throw uh, from the window over the urinal in the men's locker room uh, over another fence and onto the, the practice screen. And the, the guy who who won, who got it closest to the pin, actually climbed all the way into the urinal and stood in it and leaned out the, leaned out the window. The, I also write uh, about non-golf with the other half of my brain. The New Yorker lets me write about golf only about once every couple of years, so I have to at least pretend I'm interested in other subjects. Uh, the current, my current assignment, as Bob said, is about the difficulty of breeding giant pandas in captivity. Um, uh, David Wilt, who is the head of reproductive sciences at the National Zoo in Washington, DC. He's the head of a, uh, the Center for Species Survival. Uh, explained it to, to me uh, succinctly. He said, some pandas, know how to some pandas know how to have sex and some don't. Uh, the ones at the National Zoo don't. <laughs> this is a difficulty that is uh, shared at other institutions. In China and in South Korea, uh, scientists have actually shown porno por panda pornography to uh, panda pairs that were having difficulty without success. The great difficulty with pandas is that there's a very narrow window of fertility. Females are, are receptive for only sometimes only 12 hours a year, and so everything has to be coordinated very closely. 
the keepers get very intensely involved in these. It, the, making it all work in a zoo requires lots of monitoring. Most of the, there's a lot of collection of urine to test uh, for, for hormones, and they do it constantly. And as the, the, the time approaches, they have to be more and more assiduous about collecting it. And most of the, the keepers at, uh, the zookeepers at National Zoo are women. And I asked, I asked them if they had ever tested their own hormones, because they were talking about how intensely involved they were in all this. They spend, spend the night there while they're doing it. And they said no, but one of the women said that when she was pregnant with her first child, uh, and she went to, the, to have a sonogram, uh, she was looking at the image and she said, I can see all four feet. And the, uh, the technician said that in humans, uh, two of them are usually referred to as hands. <laughs> The difficulty with the, the pandas at the National Zoo, uh, there are a number of them, but one of them is that the, the female is, assumes what uh, Dave Wilt, the scientist, described to me as a pancake position, and the male tends to just climb on top of her and stand on her back and look around. Uh, they had an idea that one point that they would put a pl big plastic cylinder in the doorway to the enclosure, and that as the female came in, leading the male in, she would trip over it, placing herself in a better position, and it happened. Uh, she did. She fell over it at, on her stomach. But the male then picked her up and lifted her off it and placed her on the ground and then climbed onto her back and stood on her back again the way he had before. And this is actually seen in, in other species in which uh, males develop theories about sexual technique and are reluctant to give them up, uh, the results notwithstanding. I got to get very close to the pandas and to see them uh, doing things that I did not realize that, that pandas could do. And the, the pandas at the National Zoo will, for example, hold a, a, an arm out to have blood drawn. Uh, they will not only hold it out, but they will grip a bar so that they don't accidentally claw somebody with their, their claws. The female at the National Zoo will uh, lie down on her side so that she can, they can do an ultrasound. They used to have to anesthetize, uh, anesthetize her to do that, but they don't now. She'll lie down. And she loves the taste of the, the blue conductive jelly, that, uh, the sonogram. And when her sonogram is over, she'll stand up and she rubs it and she licks it. And she does what they call a sonogram dance, where she dances around and she likes the taste of it. The, there's been a real revolution in captive animal handling in recent years. Uh, there, an elephant will stick out its ear so that blood can be drawn from it. We'll hold it out. We'll, an elephant will hold up a, a foot so that uh, its the, uh, toenails can be tended. A lion can be taught to hold its mouth open for a dental exam so that uh, dentists can go in and, and fix it. They'll just hold it open for as long as they're asked to. All these techniques it, are known collectively as operant conditioning, and they come from exhibition animals, the sort of uh, shows that get put on at zoos when animals are trained to do things. And at first, uh, serious zookeepers were reluctant to have anything to do with them because it looked, like, it looked like tricks. But it turns out that if you can train animals to do these things, you don't have to do what used to have to be done, which you have to lasso them or dart them, knock them out even to do simple procedures. And they've also discovered that, as anybody who has a, a dog knows, that uh, they enjoy the, the activity and they, they all uh, engage in these voluntarily. A panda who is having blood drawn will, have, it will be in a squeeze cage, but only the panda goes in voluntarily and can leave any time uh, she wants to if she decides she doesn't. This is, is, is not done universally in, uh, in, in Europe. In fact, it's, it's, not, it's not done. And it's viewed as uh, speciesist and invasive to, for example, draw blood from an animal except in an emergency, so they don't use these same techniques. One thing they've learned, that, and this probably won't surprise people either, is that, that girl animals learn faster than boy animals do. They pay attention longer. Uh, they don't get distracted. They don't look away and, and get bored. And they also found that if, while it can take uh, quite a while to, for example, teach an elephant to uh, lift its foot so that it can be tended, if they're teaching an adult elephant to do that and it, and it, and it infant elephant is watching, the infant elephant will often just run up and, and do it 
without prompting, without any sort of training. There are just 1,600 pandas left in the wild uh, in China. And there are about 350 in captivity. The goal in the captive breeding programs is to maintain the, the, status, the genetic status quo, to maintain the gene pool exactly where it is. And uh, for this reason, there's a lot, it's managed very carefully, and I had never realized this, that nearly every endangered species has a stud book uh, where scientists keep careful track of, of who breeds with what in, in captive populations. And uh, there is such a book for, for pandas. The long-term goal is to introduce captive-born pandas into the wild, and, which is, is not as far along. Uh, but the, the Chinese have had some success. The initial efforts were not successful uh, because uh, the pandas had learned to be unafraid of, of human beings, which is not a, a useful thing in the wild. But recently, the Chinese have uh, begun raising infants that never see a human. And the way they do that is by uh, dressing in panda suits. And you can see, if you look online, you can see pictures of, of whole teams of Chinese scientists dressed as pandas in uh, holding infant pandas and wearing uh, panda suits, right, uh, except for their shoes. The sh shoes would be a giveaway if the pandas were paying attention. <laughs> but it actually works, and they've had uh, a couple of recent experiences when they've been have actually been able to release pandas into the wild and have them successfully, successfully go. There are interesting cultural differences between uh, the Chinese attitude about pandas and, and what we could think of as the American or the Western attitude uh, about captive pandas. Uh, one of them is the panda suits, which, as many zookeepers told me, is not something that an American zookeeper ever would have, or, or, or animal scientist ever would have thought of. Another has to do with that the, the, it was explained to me that the, the Chinese attitude about endangered species has generally been very utilitarian. And if there is a, a, a commercial use for an animal, there's a great deal of interest. And if there's not, there isn't. Uh, the, 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 this panda program has been international. And one of the consequences of it is that there has been more of a sort of a merging of of uh, ideas, and now there's a, a very strong commitment uh, internationally in, in China and elsewhere to increasing the, the vitality of the, the captive population and eventually introducing them. There's also a, a number of cultural differences in how we think about the environment, and uh, the, one of the things that I've been wrestling with in a couple of the recent books that I've written has to do with uh, with how we think about those topics. It's very easy to look busy on the environment and much harder to have uh, an impact. Uh, most of us in this country tend to think of, uh, tend to think of our environmental actions in terms, uh, simply in terms of product substitution. Instead of this car, I'll buy that one. Instead of this refrigerator, I'll buy that one. Uh, most of these uh, issues, though, are more difficult than that. One difficulty with climate change is that the problem is cumulative. The bad things we do add up, while the good things we do do not tend not to. The question that's usually posed is, do we have the will as a society to make uh, a huge investment in renewable energy? Uh, the real question is, do we have the will as a society to leave some very large portion of the world's uh, remaining supply of fossil fuels in the ground, untouched forever. Uh, there are different questions, and it's much easier to answer yes to the first one uh, than it is to the second. Uh, all of us every day, in, in effect, answer no to the second because we're not tremendously interested in doing that. The, I can give a, a, a good example, I think, of this difficulty from my own experience. During the summer of uh, 2010, I gave a talk on climate change in Melbourne, Australia, in a state-sponsored conference. Uh, it was a week-long state-sponsored series of lectures, and, and I flew to Melbourne to give this talk. Air travel is a major contributor to the, our carbon problem. Uh, air travel accounts for approximately three, something like 3.5% of our total energy consumption and our uh, uh, contribution of greenhouse gases to the, to the environment. 
Uh, my flight to Australia consumes a lot of energy. In fact, my share of the jet fuel consumed just by that one flight was the, the equivalent of all the energy used in a year by the average human being, the average person on Earth, just that one round trip. And I also took my golf clubs and my Hertz number one uh, gold card. When engineers look at the air travel problem, they tend to think in terms of efficiency of materials. We'll make the engines work better so that they use less fuel. We'll make the fuselages from lighter materials so that they're lighter and the planes don't consume as much energy. Uh, we'll use computers to shorten flight paths so that we waste less fuel. In fact, Amory Levins, whom uh, many of you uh, have read, uh, who's uh, one of the, uh, a, 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 an advocate of increasing efficiency, has written that by mid-century, our airplanes will be 70% uh, more fuel efficient than they are today. And that sound, sounds very encouraging, except that we've already run this experiment and we know how it works out because our airplanes today are 70% more fuel efficient than the airplanes of less than half a century ago. Uh, if you uh, flew from Melbourne, uh, from New York to Melbourne in 1958, you would have taken a Lockheed Super Constellation, which was a propeller plane. It consumed more energy than my flight to Australia did, and yet it was greener uh, because it required stops in San Francisco, uh, Canton Island, Fiji, and Sydney, and it cost each passenger uh, something like a quarter of that year's U.S. family income uh, each way. If air travel uh, were comparably slow and expensive today, uh, I wouldn't have gone to that conference and nobody else would either and uh, the world would have been better off for, for it. <laughs> the problem with modern flying is not that our airplanes are wasteful. The problem is that through the steady application of engineering brilliance, uh, we have eliminated so much waste and therefore cost from long distance travel that nowadays the main impediment to traveling 10,000 miles for a week's vacation uh, is the perceived uh, unacceptability of spending a whole day uh, trying to sleep and watching movies in a cushioned reclining seat. Um, anyway, uh, these are very difficult problems and I hesitate even to bring them up, uh, especially during a summer vacation and on Nantucket, even on my enemy island, uh, to which I brought my golf clubs uh, anyway. And if anybody has a question, I would be delighted to answer it. And if you don't have a question, I can ask one myself. <laughs> No, it's, it's, all my, it's all my own research. And one of the, I think one of the things that, that non-journalists don't realize is how much, of, how much of what we read is really just the, comes from freelance writers. Uh, and you'll read uh, dire warnings about this or dire warnings about that, and you probably should think, is there any more than a freelance writer and a fact checker behind this? So no, it's not, there's not a team of researchers. There are a number of extremely interesting scientists who, for whom this is the, who've spent their lives doing this. And one of the interesting things that I learned was that it has to do with the, the necessity of wearing those panda costumes. I spoke, I interviewed a, a man who spent his entire professional career studying pandas. He said he's, he's seen one in the wild exactly once uh, and it was running away. Uh, they're very hard to see in the wild, so a lot of what we know about them is, is, comes from from zoos. So even net people who don't, uh, who aren't freelance writers don't necessarily have a lot of first-hand study of them. I met another uh, scientist who, who had, was interested in analyzing uh, panda feces and, and had to collect it and he uh, trained a dog to find it in the, wo in, in, in the wild. And he said that the, the dog worked pretty well for a while until it began to think of the, the panda scats as its reward uh, and would would return with uh, scientific evidence on its muzzle, uh, but nothing that he could analyze. 
Yes. Yes, I'd be delighted to. The Making of the Masters is the book that uh, I was had the good luck to write when I spent so much time at Augusta National Golf Club. And the idea was to, the club let me into its archives. I was the first person that they'd ever let inside uh, look in their files. I had access to everything and could talk to anyone. And the most surprising thing that I learned is that the both the tournament and the club barely got off the ground. They were started in the, the club was started in the Great Depression. They, the initial plan was much grander than, than what they ended up doing. The tournament, the Masters Tournament, which I think is the, 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 the great last unscrewed up sports event in the world, uh, began initially as a, as, a, as a way really to, to try to get people to join that club. Uh, they had very little success. It cost you could have joined Augusta National for a hundred dollars, uh, and your, your your dog could have joined if uh, if your dog had a hundred dollars. The Clifford Roberts, who was a, the co-founder and the first chairman, saw a newspaper photograph of a bunch of golfers standing around in front of a of an of an inn in the Northeast, and he wrote a letter to the proprietor saying that he, he and Bobby Jones were starting a golf club in, in Georgia and they would be interested in inviting the, these golfers in the photograph to join the club. And the proprietor wrote back that most of the golfers in that picture had been boys home from school uh, and that would probably not be interested in, in joining a, a golf club uh, in the southern United States. And they, I, one of the things that I got to see when I was there was that these huge fat files full of, of uh, letters from people, the, the, the ones, the few who had bothered to write back to say, no, no, thank you, they would not like to be a member of Augusta National Golf Club, which now all the golfers in the room now, and not only for, I think for, for about probably a total of $2,000, you could have had a membership and a building lot overlooking uh, Amen Corner for uh, 20 years, Augusta tried to sell real estate around the golf course and never they, they initially sold uh, three adjoining lots to one member, and a house was actually built beyond the first green. It stood until, the, uh, until 1976, but they had no luck. They, they tried to sell lots, they tried to rent lots, they combined lots into a, uh, into a uh, little residential subdivision and tried to sell it as a package, and they, uh, real estate, uh, agents in Augusta wouldn't even return their telephone calls. So it was an extraordinary effort that, 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 that brought it around. And while there was uh, first-hand research there, uh, speaking of research, much of my research consisted of, of, of playing golf, as I said, it was one of my requirements. And my usual work day, I would I'd stay on the grounds, and then I would have, get up and have breakfast, and then I would go to my office with, where there, I did have two assistants who were helping, and then I would have lunch, and then I would go by the golf shop and say that I thought I'd like to play golf around one o'clock, and my caddy would be standing on the practice tee, and I would go off and play golf. So that, this is why I was in tears when it, that project finally ended. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you typically generate your own ideas, or are you It's about half and half. Uh, the Panda idea came, was, came from the New Yorker uh, recently. Uh, I think one of the most recent pieces of mine before that was about sinkholes, and that idea was mine, uh, but it, that, it, that article was finished and sat over there for a long time until that poor man in Florida had the terrible fortune to fall through uh, the floor of his bedroom, and his bad luck was my good luck in terms of having the article run, but it was a, it, it was a, uh, a terrible thing, and nobody should... You should go to Columbia before you go to Florida, I would say, after, uh, <laughs> after seeing, seeing some of the sinkholes down there and uh, see, seeing some of the... Fat. The, the terrain of Florida is, is, is very much like Swiss cheese. It's a, a carbonate sedimentary limestone uh, that acetic rain for you know, eons has been eating through gradually. And so it's, it just looks like there are holes punched through it. And every once in a while, the stuff on top of it uh, falls down. And there, there, there can be tremendous, tremendous uh, cave-ins and cavities. And F Floridians have followed their natural human impulse to do things like throw 
cars that they're tired of into sinkholes and things, but they're, they don't fill up. They're, some of them are extraordinarily deep and they're actually connected. I met a group of cave divers who have explored many miles of this network of, uh, of interconnected sinkholes and they, they once uh, did a, I can't remember how long it was, how, how many miles it was, they went through this cave system. Uh, down at uh, 300, 300 feet down, uh, the entire expedition took something like 24 hours. For every hour underwater at that depth, I think they have to spend three hours decompressing. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary feat that they did and, and frightening because it's not, it's dangerous. Now, and I, as I, I wrote in the New Yorker that I was embarrassed, uh, I didn't know whether I was proud or embarrassed that it had taken me almost an hour to ask a question that uh, the divers said most people asked them immediately. Uh, and the answer to it is that they don't. They said that they eat very carefully and that when they're underwater, they consume so much energy just in staying warm that they, they're much more concerned about taking nutrients in than in, than in getting rid of them. So, um, but anyway. I was a bad reporter there. It took me a long time to ask them about that. And the night before we went to Carabas, which is not where I necessarily would have gone before I was going to spend the day, in fact, the weekend underwater. Yes, yes, ma'am. Could you talk a little bit about writing for the New Yorker uh, relative to other magazines? The New Yorker has a certain panache or thinks it does, and, and what do you know is your thoughts about Gulf Digest versus other magazines that you have written for New York? Uh, the New Yorker is wonderful. It's it's lots of fun. I'm I'm uh, the I I've had a little bit of an unusual career in that when when we lived in New York, I wrote mostly for the Atlantic Monthly, which is in Boston, and I never went to that office. And when we uh, moved out of New York, it was when I started writing for the New Yorker, and I almost never go into that office. I had when I started writing for the Atlantic Monthly, uh, Bill Whitworth, who was the editor then. Uh, took me out to lunch at the, in the uh, coffee shop at the Ridge Carlton in, in Boston. And when we went in to have lunch, the maitre d' pulled the, the table out at the, at the banquette thing. And I sat in. And then Bill sat next to me. So we were sitting side by side. And it, if you ever have a, a job interview with somebody, you do not want to be sitting side by side with them because the whole conversation we had to be turning like that. And then when it finished and we left, I accidentally got into the same compartment of the revolving door with him as we were going out. So I was right behind him make, taking little tiny steps, taking little tiny steps as we went out. Uh, but that worked out very well and I, I enjoyed writing for The Atlantic for about six years. But then uh, sent uh, a letter to Robert Gottlieb, who was then the editor of, of The New Yorker, and sent him some things. And he lost my letter, and so I didn't hear from them. I thought, oh, well. But then he, he, he called and apologized and had. And uh, I started writing, when I started writing for The New Yorker, I was writing mostly talk of the town uh, stories, the, the short articles at the front. And in those days, they weren't signed. And people have often said, this, wasn't it horrible not having your name on it? But it was, it was actually great, because my my mother and my grandmother, my grandmother assumed that I wrote all of them. <laughs> and my mother was, I could, you know, I never had to say, that, explain that I didn't have something in that week because she would just assume that one of them was. And there was also a kind of, it was liberating in a way to sort of speak in the voice of the magazine, the we, that could sometimes get a, a little hard to bear, but it was fun. It, 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 it led to some possibilities. Uh, then that changed. Now they're all signed, and it's not quite that same that same thing. But it's a it's a wonderful magazine to write for. Uh, it's changed, I think, for the better uh, during the 22 years that that I've been writing for it. Uh, articles are shorter. They were way too long in the past. I think they're they're much longer than articles almost anywhere else. But they were really long uh, 25 years ago. I look at the, go back, and when I, the first piece I wrote was a profile of a guy who uh, was a former rock, uh, rock uh, publicist. And when I wrote it and turned it in, it, it was huge, and they, it went into proofs just exact, that same link. And I thought, you know, you get paid by the word. I thought, I'll add stuff, stuff to it. So I added a whole another couple of thousand words to it. And they just put, put them in. That doesn't, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, it's much, uh, 
they're much more careful now. And, and assignments are, are tight, tightly to a, uh, uh, to, a, to a length. And the only, the only writer who gets to write at unlimited length is, is the editor, David Remnick, who, the, who, whose pieces I think are too long, even though he's a terrific writer. Um, <laughs> But it's fun. It's I, I've had a number of different editors over the years. Uh, they're they're very good. The the New Yorker is. It's I always feel that I'm in good hands. Golf Digest is now actually owned by the same company, but they're they're not in the same building. They're in different places. Uh, and um, I I haven't I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But but it's a fun magazine to write for. Before the Atlantic Monthly, I wrote for Harper's Magazine, and uh, that was the most fun, probably. It was the least remunerative, but it was, uh, it was the most like working for a college uh, publication. And we, it was, that, was, that was a lot of fun. But um, the, the, uh, it was during the very brief editorship of Michael Kinsley, who uh, was editor there for about a year and a half, and then yeah, he got he got canned, and, and uh, uh, the magazine, Harper still exists, but it's a different magazine now from what it was then. Yes, sir? You mentioned the uh, shorter articles of the New York, you say. How is uh, electronic media digital? Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know exactly, and I th that our daughter is a, is a journalist. She works, uh, she writes every day. She works like an old-fashioned newspaper reporter, and nothing she has written has ever appeared on paper. Uh, the, we, I think Ann and I were parents at the perfect time where our children have never had to really ask us for professional advice because nothing we know uh, has any bearing on anything that they do. And we're far more likely to ask her for advice than she is to ask us. And I once gave a talk to a group of high school students and I said, you know, I said, any one of you right now could walk into the office of the editor of the New York Times and, and, and say that you knew uh, how to save journalism. And you would get an audience with him because he would think, maybe he does. Uh, and so the, uh, I, have, I really don't know. And I, I write a, a, a blog about golf that is uh, in association with Golf Digest. But I don't understand. <laughs> no, I don't understand why anybody does it except for uh, just the sort of the fun of it, which is why I do it, because it's it's not. Um, it's like a. It's more like a time-consuming hobby than than a job. And and I think that the challenge now is that the, that if you're a writer uh, wanting to do it professionally, you're competing with a lot of people who are willing to do it uh, for nothing. Uh, there's a lot of lot of stuff to read. Uh, in the I mean, it's, it's always been hard to read The New Yorker. The New Yorker's relentless. It's every week. You, you can't believe that there's another one uh, that you have to work your way through. And, <laughs> and now there's all the other stuff. I sit at my computer and I can look at, uh, I don't know, what, who knows what I'm e even looking at, you know, 25 reasons not to do something or other in, in, instead of um, reading, something, reading something real. So anyway, I, don't, I have no idea. Are there any 10-year-olds here who can tell us what? <laughs> oh. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any advice for the beginner golfer? Oh, beginner golfer, yes. I would say, I think, it, I like the way I did it. I went to golf school and got an immersion in it right away. And I felt that it really took 10 strokes off, off my handicap, not the next day, but over the, the next few months. And uh, I, I, think, I think they're good people. I, I, when I, when I turned 50, I was, I was getting pretty discouraged with my game, and this was when I had the idea of having Golf Digest send me to, ha have, to get fixed. And they sent me to the wonderful teacher in Scottsdale, Arizona, who, who was tremendous, and he, he, in just a few days, he completely turned everything around for me. And uh, I, still, uh, I still feel I haven't really, I went back to him again a year later, I drove, actually drove 13 hours to have a brief lesson with him uh, a, a couple of months after the first one and then drove 13 hours back. Uh, but, but he was great and, and he, was, he was a good teacher. He, he was a good golfer but not too good a golfer. He said that he played a, little, a few tour events when he was younger and he said he'd always been grateful 
that he hadn't been just a little bit better, because if he had been, he would have uh, spent his life being frustrated about not being able to do well on the, on the PGA Tour. Uh, and instead, he, he's had this very interesting career as a, as a teacher. He only likes teaching people like us. He doesn't teach any, any pros. And, and I watched him. There are two things that I saw him do, not just with me. One was a, there was a uh, young guy from the golf shop who was playing with us, and he was, he was having a terrible time. He was hitting, I don't know, big hooks or something. And uh, Shelby, the, this teacher, happened to drive up in his cart and saw the guy hit one shot and he complained about it. I said, well, see, he said, here, and he, he said, grip your golf club, and he said, and he stuck a T in here behind his hand and he said, Just, now, now hit it, don't drop the T. And he hit this gorgeous, beautiful shot. And he, he, said, he said, what did you do? He said, well, I haven't fixed anything. He said, come and see me tomorrow. But he said, when I saw, I saw the way you set up, the, the club face was open, but when you hit it, you hit a big hook. So you had to be re-gripping the club someplace in your swing, and I figured that if I put the T there, you wouldn't be able to move your hands. And so it was just, I think it's that ability to observe somebody who can look at something. Fixing what was wrong was going to take some time, but he, could, he spotted it just from one swing. Uh, and he was great. He also had a, a woman came to him once and said that her, she, was, she wanted to give a package of lessons to her husband, and she wanted... Shelby to promise that he would tell the husband that the money could not be refunded. The money was not refundable. And Shelby said, well, I can't do that because I, you know, uh, the, the lessons are refundable. He said, no, you have to. Uh, she said, he, he's, he's miserable. Golf was his life. He's having trouble. He can't play. But he's such a cheapskate that if I give him lessons, he won't, he'll, he'll complain and I want the money back. So you have to tell him it's not refundable. So he did. And <laughs> it brings tears to my eyes. Now, he went, uh, so he went and he took the lessons and he fixed his game and he was a happy man again. And uh, his wife sent Shelby a case of champagne and saved their marriage, saved her husband's life, so everything like that. So I think, I think it's good to get, uh, have a serious professional intervention. And ideally, if you start, it's a, starting is a good time to do it. Yes, sir. I, I've only told you a tiny bit. What's your favorite course you play and why? My favorite course is my course at home uh, because of all my friends. So that's all I think that uh, our friend and I were talking about this recently, and he said it, he was it's some kind of game where people were trying to guess things about him, and he was asked, you know, what course would you, if you could play one course with anyone, what would it be? And they all guessed, you know, Royal County down with uh, the Prince of Wales. I don't know who. It, and, he's, and he said, uh, but he, his answer was the, his course at home with his friends. So that would, that would be my real answer. Among the courses, I think Royal County down is, is one of my top of my list and uh, Pine Valley. Uh, and I don't know if there are any Pine Valley members here. I have an interesting story about Pine Valley, uh, which is that uh, the Pine Valley, the perennial number one on Golf Digest list of the greatest courses in the world. It's in Clementon, New Jersey, uh, not far from Philadelphia. Uh, I T-boned the car of the chairman of Pine Valley when I was there as a guest of somebody else. And uh, he, it was actually his fault. He was racing on the wrong side of the street and I crashed right into it. But luckily I recognized who he was and uh, realized that it couldn't come to uh, an insurance adjuster or anything like that. So I just told him to, to have his car, the body damage repaired, and to send me the, the bill, and I, I paid for it. And then I just mentally divided that sum by uh, the rounds that I've been able to play there and thought of it just as a surcharge that uh, added to it. And the place where he, he had his body work done was at the, uh, the Cadillac dealership of Buddy Marucci, who was the uh, U.S. Am I, he played Tiger Woods, and I think uh, the last it was defeated by Tiger Woods in Tiger's last U.S. Amateur. And, uh, it was a great, great amateur player. So that my that I think I have that bill someplace. I should probably frame it. <laughs> we have time for one more question. When I went back, I went back to the. Uh, is it? Oh, yes.
Well, it's been a while uh, since, since I've been back. It was the, the, the education at the, the school that I went back to was a large uh, public school, mostly working class uh, families, and the education was pretty appalling. This was in 1979. Uh, the, the purpose of the book was not to be an expose, but it ended up being, sort of being one. I just wanted to uh, you know, write about what teenagers were like. And I, I was 24, so people who were 18 seemed like they were 100 years younger than I was. Now I, I can't tell 17-year-olds from 30-year-olds. But uh, it, it, it was, I think even then, it was, kids were not getting much of an education. Uh, and it's an even, even harder problem probably than, uh, than, than the environment. I remember there was a, there was a cover story on, I think it was, a, it was Newsweek at Time, and I can't remember which was which. It, the, the first one came out in, uh, in May, and it was the crisis in our schools. Uh, and uh, it was all about the terrible things that were happening in American schools. That was in May. In uh, September of the same year, the other magazine had a story about how, like, the, the revolution in American education. So apparently over the summer, all the problems had, had been solved. And I think we probably need another summer like that where we, we get to put our heads together and solve all the problems in America's schools. Thank you, David, for a great start to our Geshki Lecture Series this summer. I hope we'll see you next Monday night, I believe, for our second um, uh, lecture. David will be available to sign some books uh, out front, and thank you all very much for coming.